The king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. In the holy name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Today we hear another section of Jesus' instruction to the disciples as they sat on the Mount of Olives during Holy Week. The disciples had come to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So they've asked him to catechize them about the end of all time, the coming judgment. And thus, Jesus' catechesis of his disciples, then during Holy Week, is just as relevant to us now and this morning especially, in these gray and latter days. So the question is that they ask and that we ask, what's happening? What do we do about it? How do we prepare? Why is all of this happening? You see, the disciples thought they were in the midst of the end of time. And maybe you feel the same today as well, as you should. Jesus then responds with a thorough and broad review of what they had already heard from the apocalyptic prophets. Their visions of the end times will have their first fulfillment in the days ahead with the death and resurrection of Jesus. But the fulfillment of those end time prophecies continue to have their fulfillment each day in the little death and resurrection of Christians in their baptism. And of course, they have in mind the final day, that final defeat of death and the great resurrection of the last day. So Jesus tells them and tells you of a great tribulation, of a second coming of the Son of Man, just like the prophet Daniel foretold. He uses illustrations like that of the fig tree and its leaves and the days of Noah and the great flood. He speaks of two servants, one that's found waiting and watching, the other ignoring. He speaks before our gospel today of next week's gospel lesson, that the parable of the ten virgins. And then he also has the story of the servants and their talents of coins and how they used the treasure that had been entrusted to them. Today's gospel is the concluding catechesis from Jesus' Olivet Discourse. It's not really a parable, though. It's really a prophetic vision of the final judgment being carried out, which he likens unto a shepherd separating sheep and goats. But he's quite vivid. He will sit as king upon his throne. All nations will be gathered before him to hear his verdict and then What is the sentence, the penalty or the pardon? And the question is, of course, on what basis will they be judged? What's interesting, though, is that today's picture, it sounds as if the judgment has already been rendered, and we're actually just waiting for the sentencing. The reality is, is that only Jesus, sitting upon his throne, has the power to either damn or to loose sins. Only God can set aside the enormous debt of his servants. Only he can commute the sentence, stay the execution, and grant pardon. They who believe that they have washed themselves white in the blood of the Lamb, well, they are those freely forgiven already through Jesus' name and by his cross. The verdict has already been handed over, and now it is time again for the sentencing. And it's to that that Jesus likens likens himself as the shepherd king who has for a time allowed those sheep and goats to live together, a mixture of believers and unbelievers. But now that time has come to its close. The sheep are those who have received the blessings of his father in faith, and the goats are those who have refused to let the blessings of the father have their way with them. And so, in the end, Jesus will separate them. 
He'll welcome the faithful sheep into his, the kingdom prepared for them and for all believers from the, even before the foundation of the world. And then he curses those who refused his gifts in his kingdom and instead would rather live in the everlasting fire that wasn't prepared for them, but rather was prepared for the devil and his angels. In the face of the verdict and then the sentence, both the righteous sheep and the unrighteous goats ask the same questions. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? I think that's the question that we need to deal with today. Specific questions. And if we don't understand them, we don't really understand how those are used as the sentence proclaimed, a diagnostic, to indicate the verdict of the last day. So it is, Jesus has described great acts of mercy. Right? Feeding the hungry, giving the thirsty to drink, taking in the stranger, clothing the naked, caring for the sick and those in prison. Right? Now those are all things that not only Christians, but really all people do as part of the first article of the Apostles' Creed, God's gift of creation. Showing mercy to all people is simply part of being a good steward of God's creation. And as you know, it doesn't really matter whether those who you care for believe in Jesus or not. And actually, there are many who don't believe in Jesus who show similar acts of mercy and kindness to their neighbor. Broadly speaking, we care for all simply because they've been given to us to care for as neighbors. It doesn't matter at all who they are or what they believe or even what they need. Hungry, thirsty, abandoned, naked, sick, or in prison, take care of them. And that's our default position as against stewards of God's good creation. Mercy. But that's not really the question then. These questions from the sheep and the goats are not really abstract questions about general acts of mercy, as if somehow if you clothe the naked or you feed the hungry or you give drink to the thirsty or you go to and do prison visitation or you also care for the sick, that somehow that indicates your salvation. They're not general prescriptions about how to live a good life that's pleasing to God, not simply that. You don't actually need today's story, Jesus' revelation of the last day, to know any of that. There's enough wisdom in Moses and in Solomon and in the Psalms of David to teach you the same thing. Love your neighbor as yourself. The golden rule, it's taught not only in the scriptures, but it's taught pretty much in every major world religion. It's not uniquely given to Christians, but even the heathen show love and mercy to one another. So then that begs the question, why are these indications of mercy specifically relevant in Jesus' final discourse about the end times? You've probably heard it said many a time. This is what it means to be a Christian, showing love and mercy to your neighbor. But notice how Jesus answers the question. They ask, when did we see you and come to you? He answers this way. The king will answer them and say, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. How is it that Jesus can use mercy as an indicator of faithfulness? How is this mercy distinguishing the sheep and the goats? It has to do with that phrase, to one of the least of these, my brethren. You see, Jesus died for all, but as you know, not all will receive him. How does he know the difference? Their belief or lack of belief, sheep or goats, righteous or unrighteous, is manifest in the way he, they treat the one whom Jesus sends to them to speak his word, the brother. That's how Matthew uses that term brethren or brother throughout his entire gospel. It refers 
to the one whom Jesus sends. So Jesus is speaking today quite concretely. Jesus is catechizing you, his church, to be especially attentive to the care of those who are given to preach and teach and administer his word and gifts to you. Because it's actually those gifts that both have brought you to church, that give you and sustain in you faith and keep you in that faith until he comes again. This is not another abstract, just love your neighbor sermon. There's plenty of text for that. This has to do with the brethren in specific. And those are the messengers, apostles, given to preach to the disciples and to you the word and deliver the gifts of Jesus. The distinction between the sheep and the goats is how they treat the one whom Jesus has sent. Those who treat the disciples whom Jesus sends with contempt will receive condemnation. He's already told the disciples this 15 chapters earlier in Matthew chapter 10. He had already said to those who failed to receive and care for his sent ones, his apostles, that they would have a more severe judgment than even Sodom and Gomorrah because they rejected the one whom they sent, he sent. But again, I think we need to dig a little bit deeper. Why is this care and support of the brother absolutely essential? Think of the memory verse which we memorized this last week in our congregation of prayer. Maybe some of you know it. You could say it with me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. Without the Spirit working through the word, you aren't restored as one of Jesus' little lambs. And Jesus has attached that authority, Matthew 28, to the apostolic church and the office of the holy ministry, which he set up. Without a church, without a pastor, brother, without the gifts externally delivered into your ears, you cannot and will not believe in Jesus Christ your Lord or come to him. That's why the sheep and the goats are distinguished today. It has to do with the care and support of the ministry by which they receive faith, become righteous in Christ through the forgiveness of sins. And ultimately, that's the only thing that matters when it comes to your faith. It's the only thing that will keep you in the faith in the days of clouds and thick darkness, the preservation of the office of the ministry in the church which he has given you. But if you don't believe me, you can just go read the Acts of the Apostles. You can see how the disciples were received or not. Read the epistles of Peter and John and James and St. Paul. Or if you need specific citations, Galatians 4, 2 John 9, Acts 16, 2 Corinthians 11. <laughs> what you'll find there is that Jesus' words always ring true. Those that received the apostles whom Jesus sent and listened to their preaching and teaching also cared for those apostles in their body, preserved that work of ministry. St. Paul, in particular, regularly commends the faithfulness of congregations who support his missionary work, even after he's long departed them and gone on to establish other congregations. Not only do they continue to support him in his ministry work for others, but then he also writes back to them and instructs them to receive in the same way the ones whom he leaves with them, be it Titus or Timothy or another. So dear brothers, brethren, today is yet the day and it is not yet night, that night when no one can work. In the name of Jesus, I forgive you for whatever lack of attention you've given to God's work, word and whatever lack of care you've had for the church and the apostolic ministry. In the same way, in Jesus' name, forgive me for not always faithfully preaching the gospel or teaching in a way that reveals Christ rather than obscures him. And together, let's be attentive to Jesus' word, always being prepared for the day that is to come, living in this forgiveness and restored to faithfulness so that we all together can wait and watch in prayer and song and scripture, knowing that Christ is coming and he's coming soon. And then that peace of God, 
which surpasses all understanding. I ask God to guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.